letter here from uh, Brother Norm Stevens. He's not on our uh, faith promise that we support, but he is uh, evangelist that we do support through our general fund and not heard from him in a while, but uh, it's a good promising letter here. It says, uh, Dear Christian friends, we sincerely thank all who pray for us and support us financially. We are incredibly grateful for your love, support, and kindness. I've been home helping Debbie get back on her feet for over two years. She continues to make some progress with her ongoing illness. Now, remember a while ago, Debbie had been real sick, nigh unto death, and had lots of blood clots in her body, and weren't sure she was going to make it. She'd been in the hospital for a while, wasn't doing good, but... We'll find out more in the letter here. It says, June has been a busy month for us. Uh, last week I met with my primary doctor who said, all is well with my blood work and kidneys. I do not need to come back for a year unless something changes between now and then. He says, yes. I talked to my cardiologist about the echocardiogram completed a week earlier. The echocardiogram shows a thoracic aortic aneurysm without rupture. It will be addressed later in life as, I, as is needed. He lowered my medication again and would like to see the results over the next few months before letting me go for a year or so. If need be, he will change the medication altogether to help me keep my blood pressure up in the hundreds instead of in the 80s or low 90s. Your prayers are still needed because I am still struggling with, some, with something else called cardiomyopathy, a heart muscle disease that makes it harder for the heart to pump and blood to the rest of my body. Praise the Lord, it is appointed unto men once to die, cause people should not fear death, Fear comes from uncertainty and the unknown. Why should God's people fear death when they know that what will happen after death? And death is a good thing for the believers in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul says, We are confident, I say, and with willing rather to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. But until then, I am confident that my life has a purpose given by God, and that death is not the end. That is why the Apostle Paul is so bold about dying. He knows what comes after death, but he knows he will be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. That's a very promising note there that we all should take note of. Uh, he says, Debbie has had good results with her testing too. The doctor said her blood clots were all gone and the damage to her heart had fully recovered. The doctors were amazed. They had told us that Debbie's heart and lung problems would always be there and she'd be most likely be on blood thinners for the rest of her life. Debbie was even getting uh, ready to sign up for a particular heart program the hospital offered her. God had other ideas. He healed her instead. God loved to surprise his children. We are thankful for every one of you for your prayers. Debbie still has some ongoing problems, including pain all over her body from head to toe. That needs attending with doctors, but God is the ultimate healer. She continues uh, to work on her diet with exercise, return to where she wants to be. We've been busy visiting others with health problems. We now know how to help by being there, for, by having been there ourselves. We have a time of prayer and talking with believers over the phone. Being on the road again, preaching God's word would be nice, however it is still going to be some time in the future. Due to Debbie's long recovery from illness, she struggles with pain and the need for strength each day. I said a friend of ours, Richard Cross, died last month on the funeral was on uh, June 19th. He said, I had the privilege of preaching the gospel and as requested by Brother Richard before his death. While we were on the road with the funeral and out of the state of Florida, we hope to visit uh, several people in North Carolina in the next few weeks. We hope this road trip will be the beginning of what will be getting us back on the road in the ministry of evangelism. Again, we sincerely thank all of you for your love and prayers and concern and financial support. Uh, it's from Norm Stevens there. Um, I miss Norm. I miss having him here, you know, at least once a year. He's kind of like our own personal evangelist. Um, uh, I think we really need to stir the, the, the coals of revival again. It would be good to have him here, but Lord is uh, not ready to have him on the road yet. So uh, we need to be patient. And our brother's been very patient as well. And his wife has been patient as well. But let's just remember them in prayer this morning.
carried a burden, a staggering weight, and struggled for freedom but could not escape. I trembled and cried at the thought of my fate. What must I do to be saved? I desperately searched for relief from my pain, but found that men's wisdom was useless in vain. Is there not a power that can break every chain? What must I do to be saved? Jesus' blood flows from Calvary, breaking Satan's power, setting captives free. Greatest gift of the greatest love. Heaven paid the price with Calvary's blood. I saw Jesus bleeding the cross for his stain. The men standing by were all mocking his pain. But then, yes, I heard it, he called out my name. Kneel at the cross and be saved. I fell at the feet of the one hanging there. Oh, Savior, forgive me, I cried in despair. My burden fell off, Jesus answered my prayer. Kneel at the cross and be saved. Jesus' blood flows from Calvary. Breaking Satan's power, setting captives free. Greatest gift of the greatest love. Heaven paid the price with Calvary's blood. Heaven paid the price with Calvary's blood. Morning, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4. The book of Acts, chapter 4. Appreciate so much the theme of the music this morning. Anybody catch what theme that might would have been? the rapture, the coming of the Lord. And uh, how many of you believe this morning that Jesus is coming again? Amen. Um, that ought to excite us. Um, and I know preachers have been preaching for over 2,000 years that Jesus is coming again. And he is. Jack was in Sunday school this morning. He was talking out of, uh, well, he referenced Hebrews 11. And you get down to the end of the, the chapter there. It says, these all died not having received the promise, but in faith. They lived. They looked for it. They looked for it. And, uh, folks, there's a, there's a number of people, uh, a multitude, that have died in faith looking for that promise. They didn't see it. Now, they're with the Lord now. Uh, they're living by sight now. We're still living by faith. Um, but he's coming. And uh, because he's coming, there's still a work to do. And you'll see where I'm going with this in just a minute. But in Acts chapter 4... We're going to be looking at a good bit of the chapter here, but I'm only going to read a few verses to start with. I want you to look down at verse 13. The Bible says, and when they, the Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. <laughs> Listen, uh, today, folks, if you believe in Jesus and, and, and you, you live for him, People will say that you are unlearned and ignorant. They'll still say that about you today. 
Uh, they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now look down in verse 29, if you would. And the Bible says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Now look down at verse 31. And the Bible says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with, say it with me, boldness. Uh, folks, I, I'm well aware of the climate of today. Uh, to be a child of God and, and uh, to, to sell out for Him and to live for Him is not a very popular thing today. Oh, but listen, God grant us the boldness in the day in which we live to just keep living for Jesus. So I'll speak to you on that subject today of boldness. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would speak to us today, that you'd help us, Lord, uh, in the time that you give us, whether, whether you take us out of here by the way of the grave or you come get us in the rapture, may we be bold for Jesus till that day. And we'll thank you, give you praise in his name. Amen. Are you a bold believer today? Are you bold for Jesus? Or are we sort of cowardly when it comes to our faith? You know, when you go off to work or young people, when you, uh, if you go to a public place, a school or, or, or wherever it is that you might go, are you ashamed to take your Bible with you? Take your Bible and put it on the, put it on your desk if you're a school teacher and, uh, and we have several around here that's been school teachers. Uh, listen, if you take a Bible and put it on your desk at school today, you might be criticized. You might be made fun of. I'm just wondering what kind of Christian are we in our faith? Are we bold or are we cowardly? When we go to restaurants, we... Uh, do you openly thank God for your for your food and the midst? Of, you know, I've been in I've been in restaurants and and prayed and thanked the Lord for my food, and I've had people come up and say, "You must be a Christian." I said, "Well, yes, I am. Thank you." Heard the story one time where I think it was down in Texas, and this this uh, group went in to uh, to restaurant and and uh, going to eat, and they asked this big man, and he had a big cowboy hat on and they asked him to pray before they ate he stood up took his hat off and just oh lord god we thank you for the food we're about to eat and i mean everybody in the restaurant just shut up and listen i mean this <laughs> no, i'm not saying you gotta be like that but he certainly wasn't ashamed he wasn't a coward in his faith uh, but are we afraid today of being criticized made fun of you know I'm glad Jesus wasn't ashamed of me when he went to Calvary I mean I was on his mind he saw each and every soul that he would die for the world and he walked up Calvary's hill and allowed himself to be nailed to a cross bleed and die for you and for me that's what he did for us but what is boldness? We look at the passage that we're speaking about here, the three verses that I read to you, and I chose these three verses out of this chapter. In verse 13, the word boldness in that passage is associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 29, the passage that I read, the scripture here associates boldness with, uh, with God the Father. And then in verse 31, boldness is associated with the Holy Ghost. So we've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost all mentioned here, uh, associated with boldness. The Trinity is brought in to account when it speaks about boldness. So, but what is boldness? Uh, can I say to you, folks, boldness is not arrogance. 
it's not being rude or crude. It's not necessarily being aggressive. It's not getting in someone's face and telling them off. You know, sometimes that can be substituted for boldness. It's not being presumptuous. You know, the Bible tells us in the scriptures in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 24 that the servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient, but we're still to be bold. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32, the Bible says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. And so boldness, uh, folks, it, uh, it, it can be a very meek and humble thing. Uh, I read this, and uh, I'm not sure who said it, but uh, it said this about boldness. Boldness is having the courage to stand for Jesus in the face of opposition. Boldness is having the courage to stand for Jesus in the face of opposition. And listen, folks, if you stand for Jesus today, you will face opposition. You will. And so we'll either stand for him or we'll cower down. You know, and I imagine in this room, all of us have stood for Jesus. And I imagine in this room, all of us at one time or another, we've probably cowered down a little bit for whatever reason. In this context, chapter 4 uh, is the healing of the lame man at the gate called Beautiful in chapter 3. Uh, we read about it, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they hated Jesus but they couldn't deny the miracle that had taken place on that day. Uh, they were hoping to contain uh, what was taking place uh, in this context of what we read. They're going to command the disciples and demand that they not speak in that name anymore. But we look in chapter 4, look in verse 9, and, and uh, then Peter said unto her, uh, no, that's verse 5, uh, back over in uh, chapter 4, uh, but if we this day be examined of the good deed done unto the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. You know, Peter didn't take the credit for what had taken place. He gave the glory to Jesus. This is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hold on just a second. <clears throat> So the apostles refused to stop preaching. Now what do we know about Peter just prior to this event? He's cowering down. He's a cowardly believer. He's warming himself by the fire of the enemy. He's cursing and denying that he even knows Jesus Christ. But now they're demanding him, don't you speak in this name anymore. And you can't shut him up. So he who once was cowardly is now as bold. They refuse to stop uh, preaching. They're going to proclaim Jesus Christ. In today's world, we're called arrogant. We're called bigoted. We're called narrow-minded. When I say that Jesus is the only way, Listen, I stood at a funeral yesterday, and I believe I preached to a good number of lost people. And I stood up in that room, and I proclaimed, Jesus is the only way to be saved. And I make no apology for it. I stand on the authority of the Word of God. If I didn't have it to stand on, I wouldn't have said it. But that's where I stand. That's not bigoted. That's not uh, arrogant. That's not narrow-minded. That's the Word of God. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so when Peter stood up and preached, he preached 
with the authority of the Word of God. But whatever they call us, folks, let's just be Bible-believing Christians today. Do we believe the Word of God today? Then let's just be Bible-believing Christians. And whatever the Bible says, let's stand there unapologetically. In Philippians 1 and verse 28, the Bible says, In nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Whatever they say about them, let them, so what? I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. My faith stands in Him. I'm looking for the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm looking for him. Amen. The basis of our boldness, as I said, is linked to the Holy Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I want to give, uh, that's all sort of introduction to what I want to give you today. Uh, but, but three ways to be a bold believer rather than a cowardly Christian. Someone who's intimidated by the world or by Satan or whatever it might be. Number one, and, and uh, we read this a few minutes ago, look in verse 13. We ought, to, uh, we ought to realize, folks, who we keep company with, who we should keep company with. In verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Listen, folks, I believe it's impossible to walk in the presence of Jesus Christ and be a cowardly Christian. We realize who we walk in the presence of. What do you have to be afraid of? I live in the presence of Jesus Christ. In verse 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. Jesus is the one, the name of Jesus, he's the one that healed the lame man. We need to make sure that Jesus is real to us. I, uh, Jack mentioned in Sunday school, and, and, and most of you know um, the story of my health, and, and um, back in 2001, was it 2001, 2002, somewhere back in there, I was diagnosed with leukemia, and the doctors gave me four days to live. He said, you, you're very sick. I'm going to say to you folks, there's nothing nobody could have done. Uh, listen, I stand here today because of Jesus Christ. And the prayers of God's people all over this world. Dr. Ron Comfort told me one time, and he's preached all over the world. He said, he said Brother Roland, he says, I don't know anybody that's ever been prayed for more than you have. And I stand to you here today, before you today, for no other reason than, than God. It was His will. He did it all. To God be the glory. Great things He had done. Is He real to us, folks? Is Jesus real to you today? I mean, we read about him in, in the Bible. We talk about, you know, being filled with the Holy Spirit. But what does that mean to us in everyday living? Is he really real to us? Now, folks, if Shalom Baptist Church is a social club, you, you, you joined the wrong social club. <laughs> Not a lot of perks that go with this social club here. Is he real to us? In Matthew 18 and verse 28, the Bible says, where, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. 
Listen, folks, we're here in the name of Jesus Christ. And by my count, there's more than two or three of us here. And the Bible says he's right in the midst of us. He's real. Amen? He is. In Matthew 28, he's real to us. He's in the midst. That's why we sing the day of his coming. I appreciate it. He's coming again. Wasn't that good? Well, just to think that I was sitting there thinking, but before we finish this song, the heavens could break. Jesus could step out. He could call us out of here. That was real to me. In Matthew 28, verse 20, he says, And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. There's nowhere that we can go as a child of God that Jesus doesn't go with us. Is that real to you? It should be. He's not left us alone, folks. I'm talking about keeping company with the Son of God. Boldness comes from knowing that Jesus is with us. You know, you know the story about the little boy that got bullied all the time. He'd always get down the street, the bully always beat him up. And one day, the little boy's brother said, I'm not going to have this no more. And he showed up. And he whooped the bully. <laughs> hey. I got somebody greater than a big brother that's with me. He's the Savior of the world. And he's always with us. The apostles were uneducated. They were unlearned. Oh, but people took note that they'd been with Jesus. Is he real to us, folks? Do we live like Jesus is real? We should because he's, he is. He's real. Do we have confidence? We should. Number two, we should, we should have confidence in God the Father uh, we're in chapter 4. Look down at verse 29, or verse 24. Uh, chapter 4, verse 24. The Bible says, And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Well, I was reading that. Even this morning, I got to thinking about that. And the Bible says he made the earth, he made the sea, and all. But have, you ever, have you ever considered all that is in the sea? I, there's a lot in there. I, I get to thinking about all that's in the sea. We, we like to go down to the coast and, you know, the heathen go to the beach, Christians go to the coast. We like to go to the coast and go fishing, and, and we, we fish off the surf a lot of time, and, and I like to get my rod way out there, so I'll, I'll wade out into that water about waist deep. You get to thinking about all in that water, you back out, you get out of that stuff. Hey, some nasty creatures in there, and all of them's got teeth. I see, I see pictures, they, they send these, these cameras down into the depths of the ocean, where there's no light. And you see these monsters down there, they come up and they like, and their eyes glow, and God put that there. I, anyway, I was reading that and, and I come across the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and my mind started running. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to do to be done. And, and so I'm thinking about, folks, we ought to have confidence in God the Father. Now, the apostles were commanded, don't preach anymore in his name. 
yet they asked God to give them the courage and boldness to do what they'd been commanded not to do. Well, I thought that was pretty good. Don't preach. And this was from the authorities. Don't preach in this man's name. God, give us the courage and the strength and the boldness to keep preaching in Jesus' name, the one that they told us not to do. I'm afraid that folks, if, if, if the authorities come in here today and said, don't y'all speak in Jesus' name anymore, how many of us would, you, whoop, okay, the, the law said we can't do it anymore. We ought to do it the more loud. That's one law we don't have to obey, folks. When we have perspective of who God is, that will give us boldness. Uh, huh. I've read this somewhere before, and I've read it many times. It says this, the person who can kneel before God can stand before anybody else. I think about Daniel in the book of Daniel. Before he stood before Nebuchadnezzar, he kneeled before God. And then Nebuchadnezzar was easy after that. Folks, that's who we stand before. Uh, the, the apostles had, they had confidence in the one that created everything. Think about the, the wonders of this, this planet that we live on. God created it all. But not just this planet. You, we, send, we send spaceships out into the heavens with, with Hubble telescopes and they look out into the universes and the galaxies and, and God put it there. Big bang my foot. God did that. And I got all the confidence in the world in him. Why can't I be bold for him? Folks, God has never lost control. Never. You, you ever been to the doctor and, and he says something like this? Oh, whoops. That's a bad thing. God never said oops. And that's where our confidence lies. In Psalms 2 and the... Uh, Acts is, is, is a quotation out of, of Psalms chapter 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Uh, and, and folks, that's what we have taking place today. The, the, the kings of the earth, the rulers, they're taking counsel against Christ, against God, against his anointed. And that means he's gonna, they take counsel against us. In verse 6, he says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Doesn't matter what they say. God has set Jesus as king. And that's who we have confidence in. They had confidence in the God as the conqueror of all things. Sin cannot win, folks. You say, well, it looks like it's doing a pretty good job today. Listen, it's time is running out. Faith cannot fail. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, it will not fail. It cannot fail. Things are out of place in our world right now. But mark it down. The church is still the bride of Christ. And one day the trumpet will sound and he's going to take us out of here. The trumpets will sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The king belongs on the throne. And he sits on the throne today, but one day he's coming back. He's going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and he's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. Mark it down. How do you know that, preacher? The Bible tells me so. Who's the real criminal here? Today they're throwing preachers in jail for preaching the word of God. But I want to tell you folks, the devil's the real criminal. 
Hey, listen, there's a day coming. He's going to be chained and he's going to be cast into everlasting darkness forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The Bible proclaims it to be true, so it's true. I've got confidence in God in that. So why not be bold? There's not a problem that's too big for our God. He can handle it all. Proverbs 29, the Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Listen, when uh, the apostles were afraid, they took their eyes off a man and they put their eyes on God and they had boldness. And that's where our eyes, well, we just need to take our eyes off our problem, put our eyes on the one who created it all, the one who has not lost control, folks. Wait on him. Brother Swanky says, you, you know what the problem with waiting is, though, right? You have to wait. So, they kept company with the Son. Uh, they had confidence in God the Father. But then in verses 29 through uh, 31, they received courage from God the Spirit. In verse 29, and now, Lord, uh, their threatenings, uh, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal uh, and that signs and wonders may be done in, by thy name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Courage comes from the Holy Spirit. Lord, give us, give us courage. Give us boldness to live for you. Uh, the, the word servant in verse 29 uh, just means that he's a bond slave. I'm just a bond slate of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give thy servant, thy bond slaves, boldness. Listen, folks, boldness not for rebels. Boldness is for God's servants, those are, that are his bond slaves, those that do his, bid, his bidding. I don't think we'll ever be truly bold until we're, until we're surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, that's where boldness comes. When I surrender to Him, when I turn it all over to Him, then He gives us the boldness to live for Him, to speak for Him, to do His bidding. The wicked flee when no man pursue it, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Is there unconfessed sin in our life? If it is, we're probably going to lack boldness. Is there any area in our, in our life that's not surrendered to God? Is the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart right now about some area in your life that you've not surrendered to Him? If it is, you're probably not, you're probably not going to have the boldness that we're speaking about in this passage here. The apostles wanted courage. And folks, you and I need courage today, too. We need courage to live for Jesus Christ. It's easy to just go along with the... It's easy to go along with the world. It doesn't take any effort to swim downstream. Years ago, there's a... Down on the Yakin River, there was a used to be a, a textile plant there and and they they had these big pumps uh, down on the river down from the plant they this big platform and these big pumps would pump water out of the river up to the to the plant we'd go down and as boys we'd get up on that thing and we'd dive off of that thing and there was an underground current in that you'd hit that water and 50 feet down the river, you'd finally come up. It's, it was a rush. I mean, I look back at it now. You, I had to be a fool to get up on that thing and jump in that water. But we'd dive off and, we, and 
and it was nothing to swim to go down but then you had to come back and that was a job getting back up the river anybody can go downstream that's easy turn around go against the flow and be bold for Jesus that's what they were asking for Lord give us boldness they didn't ask for safety they asked for courage to do what they've been commanded not to do Lord, don't keep us safe just give us courage to just keep talking for Jesus. Wow. That's pretty good. Give us courage to do what got us in trouble the first place. I think that's what my kids always ask for. Because they kept doing the same thing over and over again. Anyway, I'm going to stop with that. You get the idea? I got some more here, but I think that's enough. Boldness. Do you have it today? No, I, I believe we, we ask the Lord for boldness, and I believe he'd give it to us if we'd just take a step. Here I go. And open your mouth for Jesus, and you'd be amazed what he'll do for you. Courage and boldness. It's rooted in God the Son, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. What do you not have to be afraid of? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.